God bless the great state of North Carolina. Well, I have some breaking news for you. As of today, the Iowa Democratic Party is halfway through counting their votes. And finally, they're prepared to declare a winner, Donald J. Trump. These are remarkable times we're living in. Two weeks ago, the United States Senate acquitted President Trump and rejected these ridiculous It was a one-sided partisan show trial from the House of Representatives. It was driven by partisan hatred. That's right. And I gotta tell you, having sat there, 100 senators sitting in a room 13 hours a day, not allowed to speak a word. Bless you. Drinking milk. I got drinking milk. We did drink milk. You had U.S. Senators twitching. We're not used to not being allowed to talk that long. And I have to say, I think my favorite moment of the entire trial was at the end of the questions from the Senators, the last question the Chief Justice asked on behalf of a Senator, he said, would the House managers care to make a closing argument? And Adam Schiff stood up. out his chest, you could see him getting ready. Pencil back. And behind him, Jerry Nadler ran past him, pushed him aside, and went to the podium. And Schiff is standing there over his back shoulder going, Jerry! 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 And Nadler was not listening to nothing. And he just goes into his closing just stands there just like wanting to wring his neck. And then he just kind of sits down defeated. And I have to admit, at the end of Nadler's remarks, I wanted to stand up and ask unanimous consent to give Nadler ten more minutes. <laughs> but when impeachment started moving, I made a decision to step up and do everything I could to lead the fight and to explain to the American people what was going on and explain to the American people the factual issues, the legal issues, and in particular that the Senate was going to follow the Constitution of the United yes, States. Sir. So one of the things we did is we launched a podcast on the first day of the trial. And we did the podcast every night. We would do it late at night when the trial wrapped up. So midnight, one, two in the morning, we'd go down to a studio and film the podcast that night, real time. First one we did was at 2.46 in the morning. And it ended up going from non-existent, never existed before, to skyrocketing up the charts. It became the number one podcast in the world. We had over two million downloads in just two weeks because I think the American people were hungry for substance to understand what was going on, not to have the nonsense and the lies and the propaganda that you see on the mainstream media, but actually to hear the truth about what was happening. Amen. Now, my favorite episode is called Verdict with Ted Cruz. My favorite episode was one where I invited Lindsey Graham to come join me. Now, Lindsay came, he came about midnight, and Lindsay, you got to understand, Lindsay had no idea what a podcast was. <laughs> and we were filming in this basement in D.C., so we go through this back alley, we're going down the stairs, and Lindsay looks around and says, all right, if I have never seen again, would somebody let the authorities know I was last seen in an abandoned basement in downtown D.C.? <laughs> we sit down. And look, this was by design a pretty low budget affair. We had a couple of chairs. We had two microphones, each about the size of a football. We had some very inexpensive furniture and we had shag carpet straight out of the 70s. <laughs> Lindsay looked around and said, 
If y'all are the number one podcast, who the hell is number two? <laughs> is this some guy in the park with a van? Like, what are we talking here? But I think there is a hunger on the part of the American people. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Tell it. To hear the truth, to speak the truth, and to stand up for liberty. The day before the impeachment vote, we had the President's State of the Union address. How many of y'all watched the State of the Union? I think that is the single best speech President Trump has ever given. Yeah. And it illustrated the incredible divide, the stakes that we're seeing in our country. The president talked about how we've got right now today the lowest unemployment in 50 years. <laughs> Last time unemployment was this low was 1969. I wasn't even alive. <laughs> that was when Neil Armstrong was taking one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. President talked about how we've got right now today, we've got the lowest African-American unemployment ever recorded. Woo! We've got the lowest Hispanic unemployment yeah! ever recorded. Woo! And as the president went through each one of these, you could see the Democrats with their arms crossed, blaring, refusing to applaud. I get they don't like the president, but they're refusing to cheer for the American people. They're refusing to stand up for victories for the American people. And I'll tell you what I thought was the quintessential moment. Is the president talked about how in the last three years we've seen seven million Americans come off of food stamps. And ten million Americans come off of welfare. And not only did congressional Democrats not cheer, but they hissed. You could hear them. It was like you'd gone into some lefty college campus and they were mad at someone for not being politically correct. They're hissing. And I want you to stop and think about that for a second. Think about what that means. They're against a democracy. You, well, that's true. They're against our republic. You look at seven million people coming off of food stamps. And don't think of that just as an abstract number on the wall. These are real human beings. These are real lives. That means right now, today, in Raleigh is a single mom who three years ago didn't have a job and was dependent on the government for her food. She's gotten a job in the last three years, and tonight she's going to come home to her apartment. She's going to open the door to her apartment with a bag of groceries in her own. She's going to set those groceries down on the kitchen table and her kids, her son, her daughter is going to look up at mom with a newfound respect because she's got the dignity of work. She's got the self-respect of providing for her families and those are people's lives being changed and regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we should celebrate. <laughs> The partisan divide was, I think, illustrated sadly and profoundly when at the end of the speech, Nancy Pelosi stood up and ripped the speech in half. It was horrible, it was disrespectful, although I will tell you, I did give the president a bit of advice. I said, next year, laminate the speech. <laughs> although, since we'll have a Republican speaker, it's not going to be a problem. If you look at that extreme partisanship that we saw on display in the State of the Union, and it's reflected also in the 2020 Democratic field, you've got Tweedledum and Tweedledum. I mean, they are galloping to the left. They're embracing positions that are so far out there. Even a couple of years ago, 
those would not have been remotely in the mainstream. They're advocating raising taxes on every American. They're advocating open borders, making it no longer a crime to cross the border illegally. They're advocating aggressive gun control. Indeed, one of them, sadly, from my home state of Texas, said, damn right, we're going to come into your house and take your guns. No, no, no. Come and take them. We're seeing Democrats saying they want to take away the health insurance that Americans have all across this country. Make the health insurance you have right now on your job illegal. We are seeing Democrats openly embracing socialism. And Bernie Sanders just a week ago, here's what Bernie Sanders said a week ago. He said, if you're a pro-life Democrat, you have no place in the Democratic Party and get out of the party if you're pro-life. Well, let me say to every pro-life Democrat in the state of North Carolina and every pro-life Democrat in America, come and join us. We welcome you. This is a fundamental divide. It is a divide between free enterprise and socialism. It is a divide between law and order and lawlessness. It is a divide between freedom yes. and tyranny. Yes. 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 And that brings us to North Carolina and this race for E.C. Sykes. Now you may be wondering, what am I doing here campaigning for a Secretary of State candidate? Let me tell you why. Because I know this man. I know his heart. I know who he is. He is a major CEO. Fortune 500 leader, has led a manufacturing company, has led a high-tech company, has led tens of thousands of jobs, has created jobs. Secretary of State is in charge of regulating businesses, and especially small businesses in the state of North Carolina. Don't you think it would be nice to have as a Secretary of State someone who has created jobs before? Someone who's a businessman, an outsider, instead of a 24-year career politician who has been in office since Vanilla Ice was on tour. <laughs> I promise you I won't break out this song. But EC is a serious man with serious experience, but he's also a man of principle. Yes. He's a man who has demonstrated he's willing to stand up and fight to defend life. He's willing to stand up and fight to defend marriage. He's willing to stand up and fight to defend religious liberty. And that courage to stand up and fight for your principles is desperately important, especially yes. today. Yes. 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 I know E.C., I know his heart. He is a man who brings humility. He is a servant leader. He simply says, here I am, Lord, use me. Bless And that is important, but I'll tell you why this race also matters. Listen, North Carolina is a swing state. Y'all are a purple state. You know that hundreds of millions of dollars are going to flood into your state. It is entirely possible the presidency of the United States will turn on the election outcome in the great state of North Carolina. It is entirely possible control of the United States Senate will turn on what happens in North Carolina. It is entirely possible control of the House will turn on what happens in North Carolina. And this race could be decided by a few thousand or even a few hundred votes. So I'm here because I want to see strong, effective statewide leaders like E.C. Sykes on the ballot who can turn out, who can mobilize, who can energize, who can excite conservatives and common sense North Carolinians to defend our vows. Yes. yes. Woo. Look. Woo. The crazy left, they're going to show up and vote. Okay. They hate the president, and they will crawl over broken glass to, to vote for him. That means 
<laughs> We've got Let's a responsibility <laughs> here to make sure everybody else turns out. Yes. 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 So I want to ask everyone, we've got right now a Republican primary for Secretary of State. I want to ask everyone between now and Election Day, you got early voting right now, you got Election Day coming up, I want to ask everyone here to go out and vote for E.C. Sykes ten times. <laughs> Now, now look, now look we're, we're not Democrats. I, I'm not advocating voter fraud. Just get 10 people to come and vote for you. You are exactly right. Let me tell you how you do it. You go out and vote, and you get on the phone or you get on email, and if you get nine other people to show up and vote who wouldn't have voted otherwise, you've just voted 10 times. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. an election that matters, that makes a difference. And so I just want to encourage you, and I, and I want to close with this, I want to encourage you to have a joyful spirit. Yes. To be happy warriors. Look, the other side, the left, they are so angry. They are so shrill. How many radical leftists does it take to screw in a light bulb? That's not funny! <laughs> By the way, I asked that a few weeks back. Someone in the back of the room called out, well, well how many does it take? <laughs> and I said, actually, nobody knows, because that would require work. <laughs> but from our perspective, don't respond in kind when they're angry and hateful and showering ugliness, we should respond with love and joy and winsomeness because you know what? Our ideas work and theirs don't. Amen, There's a popular meme online pushed by the left. It's a picture of me and it says, Ted Cruz ate my son. I retweeted it and simply said, he was delicious. <laughs> If we are happy warriors and we stand for the principles that work, we stand for free enterprise, we stand for free speech, we stand for religious liberty, we stand for the Second Amendment, we stand for the freedom and potential of every American man and every American woman, we stand for jobs and higher wages and opportunity, and we stand for the Constitution of the United States. That is a winning message.